Hey guys, welcome back. We are getting ready to start our trivia again. So if you guys are ready to win the CUGC Cup, go ahead and open up that chat and let's get started. First question, which Florida beach is known as the world's most famous? Do we need the Jeopardy thing? Do, 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 do. Sure, why not? Douglas H wins the game. It is Daytona Beach. So Douglas, if you uh, send us an email um, that email should get populated in the chat in just a minute. Waiting for it. Maybe not. Either way, we'll get that email to you. There it goes. If uh, you send an email to Katie, she will make sure you get that cup. Next question. What is the largest river in Alabama? Anybody know? No, not Mississippi. Anybody else want to give a stab? Five, four, hey, we got a winner, Steve. Steve got it. It is the Tennessee River. So if you send us an email, Katie, we'll make sure that you get your prize. All right, guys, we are happy to introduce Joe Sean, he is going to talk about unoptimizing your system for great scalability, reliability, and stability. Go ahead, Joe. Well, hello. Hold on one second, just waiting for the uh, video to come up. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on which part of the United States or America or the you know, world you're in. Um, I know we have a, a lot of people from Europe, um, US, Asia, they're probably still sleeping, but anyway. Um, so welcome to my presentation um, entitled um, Unoptimizing Your System for Greater Reliability, Stability, and, and Scalability, Reliability, and Stability. I'm gonna go back to that previous slide because I, I used this as my kind of introduction to uh, this particular presentation, and I want you to keep this idea of unintended consequences in the back of your mind, right? And so this is kind of the underlining theme to this particular presentation of um, unoptimize your system for greater scalability, reliability, and stability. And it's an interesting topic. Um, some people are confused by it, intrigued by it. There's a lot of uh, uh, some talk around it. And so I chose this particular topic for, for a region, and I'll get to that into a minute, and in a minute. But first, I want to kind of set up this presentation as to 
what is considered system optimization, right? And I did a Google search and I found a lot of different definitions of what is system optimization. And then, and they all varied in different degrees of what the definition is. And this is the closest definition, the activity of enhancing systems, capabilities, and in integration of sub subsystem elements to the extent that all components operate at or above the user expectation, right? And I, I know the key, key word here is user expectation. Um, not the closest I could come. So I decided to create my own version of system optimization, and that is trading something for something else, right? So this is a, a new quote for me, trading something for something else. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so what is trading something for something else? So to me, optimizing something means, in a sense, nothing is free. So you're, you're going to give up something to gain something, right? So you're going to spend some money to get some additional performance. You're going to trade some memory for some CPU. You can trade CPU for memory. There's always going to be some kind of trade-off. Um, but, but getting into that. So I'm also known for a couple other known quotes, right? Um, I've done been doing this for a little while. We have one that we like to use that say, product what great until it doesn't. Uh, a few other ones, uh, are you sure you want to do that? I tell my customers that all the time when they bring up something. And then when they say yes, I always respond, are you really sure you want to do that? Right? People get a kick out of that. So going back to the system optimization, I put up a, a little kind of chart up on the screen here of different things you can trade. You can make a trade for memory for disk op optimization, PVS, MTS, IO, kind of for example, uh, UX, um, GUI features and functionalities you're giving up for uh, additional bandwidth or network bandwidth, uh, capabilities for CPU optimization. So VMware, you have the ability to have older CPUs and newer CPUs in the same cluster, but you give up something, right? You give up some of the newer uh, features that the newer CPUs have to offer in an exchange for that compatibility, right? Uh, security for speed, uh, manageability for security, complexity for scalability, and the list goes on. And it's not necessarily optimizing something has to be a technical trade-off where you're trading one thing for another. It could also be something like supportability, um, power and cost savings uh, might be a consideration. And a lot of times we see optimizations are due to p politics or internal organizational politics, right? I'm sure some of you have had to work with the VMware group in your organization or the hypervisor group in your organization, and they have their own way of doing things. They like to build their clusters for a generic all-purpose um, VMware environment, they love DRS, they love stored DRS, but we know a lot of those settings have to be tweaked and, how do you put it, um, what, what, the, what, what the best way to put it, they don't, they're not always compatible for what you're trying to do, perhaps in a Citrix or um, other VDI type environment, right? So VDI kind of is a special place that has uh, very resource intensive, hits all points of the network, uh, but you have to interface with a lot of different people. The AD people have their own way of doing things that may not be compatible for what you want to do for group policies and group policy loopbacks. So you go and you use WEM instead to get around some of the challenges that the AD team might put in front of you as far as user policies and configurations. Right? And, and so we, we it's, it's like I'm saying, system optimization isn't necessarily uh, confined to a technical trade off for another trade off. Um, so, this presentation is it, it's very um, story driven. I'll get into some, some more technical details. And after this presentation, we have the round table. So, if you guys want to get into some really deeper, um, into the rabbit hole type optimization questions, we, we definitely can do that. But um, for, the, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm gonna kind of go through what I kind of see 
is optimization. And I know we've all done this. I've done this too. So as this goes, it's starting to become fall. And then as I know, we've had 144 days of 100 plus um, degree weather out here. So it's starting to cool down. So everybody's getting excited, getting below the 100s. And for us, that means we can go outside. Right? We're no longer combined inside. We can actually go out to our porch and not melt. Um, so this idea that now we can go outside and enjoy our lawn, enjoy uh, our backyard, right? But when we get out there, we see this, right? But this is what the reality looks like today. So, but you want your environment to look like this. So you're gonna grab one of these to take this and try to beautify your lawn to look like this. You kind of wish you had one of these, but they are kind of pricey and expensive so to, to move this, but you really want this. So instead of buying this, you take this to move your pile to get this. And when you're all said and done, you grab a beer, you grab your lawn chair, you sit back and relax, right? Time to celebrate. So you sit down to enjoy this, but you see this. Well, it's like, okay, you just essentially moved your pile from your lawn to your driveway. And so one broken lawn chair later and a few, a few expletives, right? You still have to deal with this. So you grab your shovel, wishing you had one of these. Oh, wait, now you just, now you own one of these, so you can take this, and this happens, right? So another lawn chair later, a few more expletives, and you hire this guy. So this guy can take this, deal with this, and so this guy now takes this to move this, and now you're back to this, right? all because you didn't go out and buy a, uh, um, a dump truck to deal with it. So all you've done in this, in this scenario is you move the problem uh, with some of your optimization. And then when you have to deal with the unintended consequences, as I was saying earlier, you have to move that stuff back, right? And then instead of moving it to where it needs to be, you, you end up moving it back to where it was. And so we end up with a kind of a train wreck. So. So let's, let's get into a little bit more details about why I decided to do this presentation. And I came up with this presentation about a year ago and given it to a couple of the local cubs and out in San Diego as well. And the reason I did this is because as a consultant, I go around, I go to different customers and I see what they do and I see the impact of what they've done. And there are a lot of optimization tools out there, a lot of great people, a lot of great minds that put this stuff together. But I haven't found, I found one tool, and I'll get to that in a minute. Well, I found one tool that works really well, it's the Citrix Optimizer, right? So Martin, Zurich, and, and Citrix have a Citrix Optimizer. So there are a bunch of other community-based tools in, in, out there. And when I look at them, I see a lot of older optimizations in there, stuff that don't apply. I go to a customer site, I go look at the group policies, I see a bunch of registry edits in, uh, registry entries in, in the GPOs, and I go through each one and see what optimizations that they've applied. And you look at them, it's like, hey, why do you have this optimization for PVS and this optimization for PVS? And you realize those are for PVS 6.0. You know, you're running 7.0. So you, you're making all these tweaks for, for um, an older version of PVS that no longer apply. Same thing goes for the operating system. Hey, you have all these network optimizations. They work great in Windows 2008 R2, but you realize that some of those optimizations don't exist or work in a 2016 or 2019 environment. That also being said, you see, I guarantee every time I go into a new environment, look at the ESX environment, they always have P states, C states, all these other balanced optimizations for VMware set up, right? So 
you see that they haven't gone in and optimized the, the system because they're relying on all the documentation or older ideas that, hey, these things didn't work initially, so we're going to we're, we're not going to use them. We're not going to use certain optimizations, or we are going to use certain optimizations because we had success with them. But then several generations later of the product, the, the, the solution, it, it changed, right? So we don't go and reevaluate um, different things. So kind of back to this, the PVS, um, had an optimization, and so and in with 1903, uh, they added that same optimization to MCS. So, in 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 a sense, we are going to trade some memory for um, for some disk optimizations in PBS. So this is an example of trading one optimization for another, right? So we're trading RAM for disk I/O, and we're kind of seeing, you know, you know application wanting to use a lot of RAM. And so this kind of gets into a story with the, a couple customers that we had where we're starting to see more and more web-based applications, more and more customers using Internet Explorer. And in, and we're starting to see some, you know, from VMware, from, from our Zen app servers, our Windows 10 box, we're starting to see a lot of resource consumption. And when we go to investigate, we see that, Chrome is using a lot of memory for each individual user. We've seen, you know, some users had used two to four gigs of RAM is allocated just for the Chrome processes per user. So, so what do we do? So we there's this optimization in RAM called the working set optimization, and what it does is it goes through and it tags memory, basically. It goes out and checks uh, all the different processes to see what what uh, applications have touched, what bits and pieces, uh, what memory had been used or hasn't been used. And after a certain amount of time, in this case, but it's two hours, 120 minutes. And if that memory has been used, it asks the system to flush that memory, uh, that, that, that that application memory from being in the active memory down into the page file. So basically, you can take the memory, flush it out so that more active memory can be used for other processes and by other users, right? So when you look at this, you think, okay, I'm going to have this optimization. You, can, you just come in, they start work at 8 o'clock. It's not until two hours later that that optimization starts to kick in, right? So you're kind of thinking, okay, well, how do I speed this process up? I can't wait two hours to get some of this memory back because I've got 10 users on here and they're sucking up 32 gigs of RAM. Uh, so how do I how do I try to optimize my system so that I can get more users on the box and not and and not use more memory, right? So I'm out of memory. So how do I how do I deal with this? So the idea is you start to take the 120 minutes and move it down to an hour. Okay, great. Everything working. Everything's working uh, much better. I'm starting to save some memory. Um, so 60 minutes, good. Well, how about a half an hour, right? So, uh, you know, I got great benefit from, from 60 minutes. I'm getting some better results for half an hour. So let's just bump it down to 15 minutes. Heck, why not just crank this all the way down to five minutes? Well, that's kind of when we start to over-optimize a little bit because in what we've kind of been finding out is you you provision the machine with PVS or MCSIO with the caching enabled. So we're trading memory for disk optimization, but now we're going to take memory and then dump it back to disk. Does that make sense? So we're kind of going the opposite way. So we, we optimize the system to try to mitigate disk IO and then we immediately enabled another optimization that's going to take that memory and dump it back to the disk. And when we did that, we started seeing all kinds of disk contention on this. So basically, every five minutes, it was dumping memory after memory after memory to the disk. And it's like, okay, but you would think that after a while, you just, you know, it would have kind of balanced itself out and what the users are using, they use, what they're not using is on disk, but that's not how users work. Users have 17 tabs open, 
and they flip through them constantly, right? So while they're waiting for one thing, they go check the email. When they're done with the email, they're going onto the banking site. When they're done with the banking site, they're back to the you know the e uh, online ERP. They do a few things. They go to an, a third application. So there's a reason why they have 17 applications open. So what's happening every five minutes is you know they're on one page for five minutes. So all the other 16 tabs go to disk. Then they flip through. So those have to be reread into memory. So we're pulling that off of the disk back into memory only for five minutes later that they're on another tab and that's getting flushed back to disk. I don't know if you guys can see this chart. This is kind of an example of what we were seeing here is we had this massive memory utilization from the users, right? And then we see as, as in, in here, we see the disk utilization goes up, 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 and up to the point where we have CPU zero running at 25%. So there's four clocks in the box. Uh, if, if For those that you uh, know how some of the inner workings go, when you start taking stuff from memory and shove it into the page file, it, it goes to CPU zero. Doesn't matter if you have four CPUs or eight CPUs, some of the kernel functions always go through CPU zero. So we're seeing CPU zero getting crushed. And kind of getting into that, it wasn't just the disk op the, 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 the disk getting trashed by this optimization. It was also networking as well. So it affected a lot of networking optimization because it was also using CPU zero in the sense that it was not optimized for RSS, right? So some of the optimization, older optimization say to turn off RSS. Even VMware had some issues with RSS um, a while back, and so the VM tools would autom automatically disable RSS. And so all that networking traffic is coming in through CPU zero, all the disk IO is coming in through CPU zero. So they're all contending for CPU zero when the three other processors over here not doing anything. And so at the end of the day, what we had to do was we had to take those virtual machines and actually give them more memory. We put the optimizations back to the defaults, and we just said, hey, we'll just put more memory into these servers, give these servers more memory, and let the users have their memory. And that was how we solved that problem, right? Is we tried to optimize the system too much that it's like, you know what, Chrome wants four gigs of RAM, let's just give it four gigs of RAM. This is how the users are gonna work, how they're gonna function. This is the way, this is the resources that they need. These are the resources we have to give it. Um, so like I was saying, receive size scaling, I still see the optimization that turn this off. And you wanna have this on, especially if you're using Windows 10, right? Windows 10 has rebuilt the RSS functionality. So there's a new version of it. And so this allows the uh, system to take multiple incoming streams and balance them across all of the processes instead of just system zero, uh, CPU zero. Um, kind of get into, you know, uh, some other optimizations. We see a lot of people, you know, this is a common one. People turn IPv6 off. Uh, no reason to turn it off. Microsoft recommends you don't turn it off. If you have an issue with it, they have some work around to how some of those issues work. Uh, mentioned like things like TCP chimney or old optimizations. We still see people trying to apply to Windows 16, Windows 2019, uh, Windows 10. You know these these optimizations are old. Um, so, I want to get into another story that, that came across this uh, a couple months ago, right? So we did the big VDI deployment with Windows 10, and the customer wants to be able to fail over um, one data center to another data center. And Microsoft has this optimization, uh, fast login optimization from Microsoft for Windows 10 that they it lit up by uh, default. If you're running Zen app on 2016, 2019, this optimization is off by default. And what, what it does is when a user logs in, it does a lot of the login processing, the group policy processing asynchronously. So the shell, 
the user shell can come up before the group policies ever um, are applied. And there's, a, there's an article, if you don't know, about how to get around some of this stuff. But the article also explains, hey, you know, things like folder redirection and stuff don't work unless the user logged off and logged back in. Well, that's great, but it didn't work. So when you're trying to fail a user over from one data center to another data center, and all the redirected folders are still pointing to the old data center, and you have to tell the user to log off and log back in, hoping that the user session would would uh, update with the new folder redirection location, then um, you know that's great. But again, that didn't work. So at the end of the day, we have to go through and, and turn off the fast login optimizations in order in order for that uh, failover functionality to work. So in some ways, that fast login optimization, you know, we were trading off the ability for um, group policy to apply synchronously, right? And, and we kind of needed that functionality. So that's another example of trading one one feature for another feature. Um, and with that, so this, this here, I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but um, um, I did talk a little bit of, that there are a lot of different optimization tools out there and some optimization guides. And going through them, you see a lot of older optimization that don't apply to some of the newer stuff that you're doing today. I still see you to turn off uh, UAC. They turn off the local firewall. Uh, they disable IPv6. They leave, They get a server in and they leave the server as balanced uh, uh, for VMware. They don't set it for high performance, they don't disable the C states, they don't optimize the the, the, the boxes, they're leaving things kind of as is, or they're going the opposite direction and they're applying a thousand different settings. And this here is Microsoft version of that. So this, there's, a, there's a team, it looks like a community based, driven by a Microsoft employee to kind of manage in, in the, the information. And if you go to this particular site, it gives you, you know, hundreds of different optimizations from services to schedule tasks to um, registry edits and so forth. And you, you're you looking in at that and it's like, how do I manage those settings, right? I've got hundreds and hundreds of settings. And even going through some of those, you know, some of those are good settings to have and some of those are not good settings to have. and. I don't know if there's this competition in the community as to who tool has the most optimizations. Who got? I got 164 over here, so mine's a little bit better than the guy over here that's got 144. So, kind of trying to figure out how do I trust these these, these tools. So. You know, I've gone through and vetted some of them. And like I said, the only one that I really like is the Citrix optimization tool. I know that they've gone through and they've vetted all of those settings. And they've even found a couple. This is why I, why I put this one in here. I actually put this slide in um, a couple days ago after a conversation that Mark, um, Martin found a couple of these optimizations in here that break Windows 10. And so he, put a ticket in there, but they still haven't updated the website. So how do you know that all these optimizations aren't going to change the user's um, experience, they're gonna change how the, uh, the operating system works, or even how your applications interact with the operating system, right? And if you just go blindly run these tools, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, I don't know. Let's just take a couple questions here. I know it's it's it, it, it's a little hard for me in this particular virtual format because I'm not getting any. I can't really see any feedback from people, uh, faces and expressions and, and an audience here. So um, this is kind of my first time doing it like virtually, virtually. Although I did one um, a couple of years ago, a short 15 minute one. Uh, do we have any questions on some optimization? We can get into. 
uh, some of the specifics in the round table in, the, in a few minutes. Um, we give you a couple more stories if you like some more stories on this. Uh, I can give you some more optimizations here. Uh, oh, let's do this. Um, this is one of my pet peeves, and also another reason why I actually did the presentation is. I don't know how many of you are using PVS or MCS. They're kind of the same now. Before they were a little bit differently. The new version of, of MCS allows you to have that kind of persistent disk that you can redirect a few things to. And sometimes you do need to re redirect a few things. But I see people redirect everything to it. And that includes the event logs, at V, the web cache, um, profiles, print spoolers, and what I call what I call the PPP. And there are some things you probably want to redirect, especially maybe in Zen app you want to do event viewer, but there are also um, like Windows 10, uh, VDI, if you, you can redirect the event viewer, but why? You know, that user is going to log in. It's not like you can log in and look at the event viewer real quick before the user logs off. Um, you're better off doing something like an event forwarder. So are you using the best technology or are you just trying to move it over here, hoping that you can capture uh, an issue that a user has with the event viewer being redirected um, at a future date, right? Because once the user logs off, the machine's recycled, it reboots, and it's most likely going to be assigned to another user. So how do you find that user, that VM for this problem at this time, and then go try to get those event logs for that specific machine? It just doesn't make any sense. The Zen app is a little easier to do since user logged off, the machine doesn't reboot. You can always kind of correlate that a lot easier. Um, but redirection, right? So this idea of redirecting services to the persistent drive, right? Called policy profiles and printing. And my my suggestion on these is no, no, and no. Again, why? What are we trading for what? Oh, people, every time I've asked this question, I get this, well, I've got that um, RAM disk, uh, the cache and RAM with disk overflow. And I don't want to have it all of a sudden fill up and then start flushing everything to disk. So I said, okay, well, let's take a look at that. So you're trading RAM for disk, right? But then when you redirect, you are bypassing that, that cache, right? So now you're no longer leveraging the, you're no longer leveraging the cache, you're bypassing it. So in, in order to try to save the cache. So what I ended up doing was I, I took this and made a little experiment out of it. And so let's take this print spooler for example. I went out and just tried to find a really large PDF. And what I did find was the Apollo 17 fight, flight plan from October 23rd, 1972. <laughs> it's a, a 600, an 18 page PDF about 20 megs in size. I wrote a little PowerShell script that would read in this PDF and then write it out as a PDF uh, using a PDF writer to the C drive so that it's, you know, goes through that persistent cache. And I ran, I ran it a thousand times. It took a little over two days for it to read in and print it out a thousand times and we started off with a differencing disk of the standard, you know, four megs um, size, right? And then we ended up with four megs. And so we could see here that we, all thousand print jobs stayed within that read ca that write cache. So every time it wrote something to the disk, it stayed inside there. There was, it, it had enough write cache in memory to not overflow to the disk. So this concern that I have thousands of users printing all the time that's going to fill up my disk, and it's like, no, it's not going to fill up your disk. Um, if you if you size your write cache properly, it won't overflow the disk. I did the same thing with a random data file generator that basically instead of writing zeros, in which an underlining storage system can interpret that differently and just discard it because they're all zeros. I found a random data generator that it can create a file and put random bits in 
into that file. So it can't be compressed. It can't be um, deduped. So it bypasses all of those underlying storage technologies. So I can stress test the RAM, see the RAM cache. And so I went through the same exercise, creating files large enough that could fit into the RAM cache, but not overflow it. And I ran 2,000 iterations of writing 100 meg files to the temp directory with three seconds in between each. And so it would write 10 files at 100 meg, so about a gig each, and then delete them again, delete them again, delete them, and do that 2,000 times. And we ended up essentially with the same results. So we started off with a four gig, or the uh, four meg differencing file, and we ended up with a four meg differencing file. So, and then because we didn't, we didn't uh, need to overflow the data. The RAM, that RAM, that RAM cache did what it was supposed to do. Um, there are a few exceptions to things. I know now the WEM cache has kind of been a disaster in a, that's a whole different story, but. Um, if you're going to use the cloud version of WEM, they want you to actually redirect it to a, a persistent disk. Again, my better nature, I don't like that idea, but they don't have an infrastructure broker on-prem that can do the caching for you. They do have a broker in the cloud connector, but it doesn't cache. So they did want, they're just trying to prevent hundreds of machines having to go up into the cloud every, every, uh, every time they boot to go grab a clean copy of the cache. So, in summary, there's a couple, couple, couple other things that kind of wanted to talk about was, you know, it, it's okay to do system optimizations, and and we still do. I'm not saying don't do system optimization. The point of this whole thing is to understand what it is you're trying to achieve with these system optimizations. Too many people go out, they grab a script, they run it, and they trust it, and they hope for the best. And what ends up happening more often than not is there's some kind of unintended consequence. And I get called in to try to troubleshoot some weird issue, only to find that a few little settings were tweaked, uh, undo those settings, and things are back to what they should have been in the beginning, right? So there were unintended consequences by running those optimizations. My best suggestion is take those optimization, take those scripts, and find out what you want to get out of that script. You don't have to run every little setting in there. Just kind of interrogate, say, hey, does this make sense for me? And I know 100 settings, 150 settings are hard to do, but figure out what is it you want, you, what you need to optimize and try to focus in on those particular settings that are going to get you closer to where you want to do. A lot of the performance enhancement settings only give you a one or two percent performance gain, and maybe years ago that was really important. Some UX changes with a user on a dial-up modem uh, made a big difference to have the cursor blinking in uh, the time clock every time, every minute the clock changed. Everybody got a screen update. Well, yeah, that makes a big difference when everybody's on dial-up. But now everybody's on broadband and cable modems and even cell phones with 5G, you don't need to have that level of optimization, right? You can allow the cursor to blink. You can allow the clock to to um, show up on the screen and change every minute and not have to worry about, you know, running out of bandwidth, right? So you want to focus on the optimization that's going to give you the biggest bang for the buck. Things like the AppX, right? So AppX is kind of one of those optimizations where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. And so those are the optimizations you want to focus on, right? Not necessarily one that's going to give you a 1% increase. Because um, now once you've taken those optimizations, you have to manage them for the life cycle of that, that particular solution that you deployed. And so I, I don't know about you, but it's hard to manage 150 different uh, tweaks and settings and stuff. And that's not to say that Microsoft and Citrix and stuff haven't learned over the years and started building some of these optimization into the product, right? Um, so there's that. There's also, can you take some of these settings and do them a little bit differently? Can you take uh, your master image and instead of just disabling the Windows update because you don't want your non-persistent machine to 
to do Windows updates in the middle of the day because they're non-persistent, they reboot, all that stuff goes away. Well, instead of just disabling that the services layer, can we move that up into a policy, right? So the master image can be in one OU that automatically enables Windows updates so that it can get Windows updates when it turns on and gets updated. Um, but when you provision out the, the shell machine for your MTS, PVS, or whatever um, mechanism you're using for your VDAs, you don't have to, you, you, they're in a different OU and the group policy automatically tells them, I don't need to do Windows updates. Um, same thing with firewall uh, updates. Yeah, people gotten better because uh, like the firewall one, people used to just go in and disable things at the services layer, go in the services.msd and disable Windows firewall. Well, that obviously broke a lot of things. So you go in and actually do policies now to kind of force them to do that. But there are other services that are like that. Like you go in at the services layer and think, I don't need this. Let me disable that. And yeah, it disabled it for what you need, but then there's this other service over here with Windows Defender. Now it's broken because it can't leverage that service because you disabled it. All right, so let's let's go through the questions here. We got a few minutes left. Uh, questions from uh, any optimization that are not important and you did not see them deployed at most customers. I'm not sure I understand. And uh, any optimizations that are, are important and do not. Okay, so one of the things that we see a lot of um, from a performance perspective that are not being done that should be done, things like RSS, right? Receive size scaling. Um, you can leave all some of the other things, task offloading stuff. Those things have been fixed, so you don't need to touch those anymore. You don't need to disable those. Um, Network optimizations have gotten a lot better. You, if you're in 2016, Windows 10, 2019, a lot of the older optimizations are no longer relevant. Um, you can leave those alone. Um, PVS, we still see a lot of PVS optimizations that uh, for 6.0 are no longer relevant because most everybody's running 7.0 or 7 a version of 7. Um, uh, VMware, we see a lot of things with um, the hardware, where the hardware is set for C states and it's set to balanced. And what that's doing is it's basically doing car, uh, core parking on, on, the, the process, the, on the process. The cores are going to sleep and waking up and going to sleep and waking up. And there's a little bit of latency that happens to wake up the core in order to have that thread processed on that specific core. And then once it's done, it goes back to sleep. And then it's got to do that you know, hundreds of times per second. And that little latency adds up after a while. And when you get to a certain point in your in your cluster, everything was great. Then there's a tipping point where the performance just starts to suck. And then you go in and you try to evaluate, well, what has the customer not done? OK, they haven't disabled core parking. They haven't set um, the VMware and the BIOS to maximum performance. Uh, they have RSS disabled on the virtual machines. They don't have any of, any of the VIA drivers installed on the ESX host for their storage, so they're not leveraging any of the storage optimization that that platform has. Um, and even in, in, and even then, you have to also pay attention what storage, what, what environment am I running this on? Because some of these optimization, I, I love the PVS cache and RAM and MCSO cache and RAM, but there are some storage appliances that don't work well with those particular technologies. Nutanix being one of them, you they want you to set that option, but then set the RAM size to zero because they want their appliance to be able to do that optimization itself, right? So it, on a Nutanix platform, trying to enable a, a RAM disk with cache overflow with a four gig, you know, four gig to RAM, and then the Nutanix platform, they're kind of fighting over uh, who's going to optimize that data that is being overflowed to the disk. And uh, the Nutanix has its own way of doing it, and it doesn't handle the overflow bit as, as well. And so you have to understand the context of that optimization that you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it and what, what other impacts could it have. Um, 
question. What about DOS in VMware and stored vMotion? Yeah, don't. Uh, for some reason, VMware folks in group, they like to light up every, every uh, feature they can. They like to tune every dial. And some dials are just best left alone, right? The for, from from a DRS perspective, you know, if you have a really large environment, you don't want to be moving virtual machines around all over the place. Especially if you have a Citrix focused cluster, you want to partition the virtual machines, not oversubscribe them. And what I mean by that is you want to carve up the resources so that those machines don't have to move because they're, they're fully loaded. You expect them to be fully loaded because you, you can't fit all the users on one physical box. You have to have multiple physical boxes, and the virtual machines are just the conduit to get those users onto that box. So there you have 32 processors, and you want to give each virtual machine eight, eight vCPUs. Well, do the math. You're going to have four virtual machines on there, you know, or, or vice versa. You want Four, four vCPUs, the eight machines, that fills up your 32 processors, right? Or your 32 cores, uh, you know, virtual CPUs, right? You don't want to oversubscribe. Once you start to oversubscribe, then you've got some resource contention when the system is fully used. When the full system's not fully used, then you don't have to worry about that, right? Then you have that generic uh, workload where I've got extra resources, let me let me just uh, um, throw it into that pool. But in this case, when you're building a large infrastructure, you don't have extra, right? You build them out. You build that extra virtual machine. You don't need to evacuate, right? You put stuff in maintenance mode. Once the users have drained, then you've got that host for maintenance. Um, all right, so it looks like we need to continue this for mm -hmm. our round table. Yep. So I'm Thank gonna end you. it here and, uh, and then I'll start up the Zoom meeting. Yeah, thanks everyone. So definitely head over to the round tables. I know if we didn't get to all your questions here, um, you can come and see Joe in the round table and ask them there. So we'll see you in a little bit. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. <laughs>